So for those of you who weren't here yesterday, this is my dear friend, Katie Hawkins, who is here for the second year, and she is not old, and neither <laughs> am I. And that's all I'm going to say about her. <laughs> and I love her. <laughs> I love April. Ladies, I don't know if you realize what a special group you all are. I've already cried off all my mascara this morning. And just the, the, the favor of God upon this place, I could not have picked better songs to go along with some of the stuff I'm going to say. And it's not like the worship team has my scripts or really, even, I mean, and yet this happened last year too. God, God wants something so amazing for you ladies of this high desert. He is present. He is here. He is excited to, um, to do things in every one of our hearts. And those songs were just beautiful. I think we have to have a little round of applause for our worship team. And I know they're, you know, but that was amazing. All right, we are going to just dive right in um, to our key verse and keep plugging away at really just trying to get a handle on what does this, these couple verses in the Old Testament actually mean to us right now here, 2018 in 29 Palms? How do I appropriate these, this set of verses, these promises for me? Okay, so last night we talked about, forget about the former things, quit dwelling on the past. He is doing something new now. And we talked about that new spirit, that new heart. If some of you are still wrestling with that, like, do I really have that new spirit, that new heart? Have I really been born again? Ladies, don't leave this conference today without talking to somebody about that. It really is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life to, to literally be filled with the Holy Spirit and become one with him. And I have some some things I didn't mention last night in my testimony, the one book I read that really cinched it for me of, from going from a religious check the box type of thing to a relationship was a little book called More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell, if anybody's ever heard of that. Um, that's what God used for me to give me clarity and understanding of what it really, what, who Jesus Christ really was and why he really came to earth. I knew all the facts, but I, I never, I couldn't put the facts together until I read that little book. So I always bring extra copies of that <laughs> when I speak in case anybody is like I was. Please grab one and, um, and talk to somebody. Okay, so we talked about that last night. Now the next little chunk little phrase in this is, I'm doing something new. Can you perceive it? And truthfully, ladies, a lot of times I have to say, no, I don't perceive it because I'm not very perceptive. <laughs> I'm a little hard-headed and a little hard of hearing. And if you would just speak up, Lord, I'd like to perceive it. If you could be a little more clear. When I was a young, Christian and first started going to Bible studies and things like this, women would say, oh, God told me this, God told me that. I'm like, well, I'm glad he's chatting it up with all you people because he does not, <laughs> he does not speak to me. And I came to some kind of erroneous conclusions. I'm like, all right, of course he doesn't speak to you. You're not part of the in crowd yet. You're, you're, you're not really in his friend group. You're on the fringes. And maybe if you hang around more and he, you know, maybe eventually he'll deign to speak to you. And then, and then I really was wild and crazy before I came to Christ, did a lot of things that were bad. And I thought, okay, I get that he's forgiven me and I've received his forgiveness, but maybe he still has a little grudge about X, Y, Z, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe mm, forgiven, but like, Ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I thought, or maybe, maybe there's some like secret formula that no one has cued me in on. And if I could, if I could just learn the steps to trigger him, then he would speak to me. So 
I had heard somebody randomly say, well, if you want to hear from God, you, you have to be really quiet and give him a lot of time. And then you'll, you'll hear his voice. <laughs> so I got on my, I put my kids to bed early and I got on my knees in my dining room. Why the dining room? I don't know. Maybe I thought if you're very uncomfortable, it might help. I, I don't know. And I said, God, I am just going to um, kneel here and be quiet until you speak to me. And I'll just stay here all night if I have to, because I really want to hear your voice. So about 3 a.m., I woke up with rug marks <laughs> on my face <laughs> and dragged myself off to bed um, dejectedly because I did, he did not speak to me. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, you poor little ignorant thing. You know, that is just stupid. But truthfully, ladies, I think, I think this is more universal um, than just being kind of a young Christian um, because just last year, I had coffee with this woman who truly was leading a very large Christian women's ministry. And we're, we're having coffee. And all of a sudden, she's, her eyes fill up with tears. And she says, you know, I don't hear. And I'm like, wow. You're deaf? You really do a good job of reading lips. I never would have guessed you're deaf. And she's like, I'm not deaf. <laughs> That's not what I mean. She goes, I don't hear God. And she said, week after week, our leaders stand up and they tell the ladies, just pray about it and God will tell you what to do. And just, you know, talk to God. He'll, he'll guide you. And she said, and it makes me so uncomfortable week after week because I don't hear him. Ladies, what was our, what's our problem? What, what is the problem? Bottom line, we really truly want God to speak in an audible, <laughs> clear voice to our ears in an unmistakable way so that we can have confidence. And then we can say, oh, I heard him. And we secretly, especially when we're young, we secretly suspect that that is how he deals with other people and that for some reason he, he doesn't want to do that for us. But the reality is, and as I grew and matured and had mentors, God does not speak in an audible, outside-the-body voice very often. Can he? Of course. Of course. And some, you know, you do hear every now and then people that have heard the audible voice of God. Because he's God. He can do anything he wants. I'm just saying that is absolutely not the norm. Because he doesn't use a physical auditory channel. Remember when we talked about body, soul, and spirit last night? And your physical body is your, your senses, and that's how you take in information from the physical world around you is through your senses, your hearing and your sight and your taste and your touch. But there's a whole different realm, and that's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us interacting with our soul. And it's an inner thing. We don't need, he doesn't use the, the, the physical part, the bios. He uses the Zoe to communicate. Mark Batterson wrote this book called Whisper, How to Hear the Voice of God. And he said, when you whisper to somebody, what do they have to do to hear you? They have to get really close. They have to lean in. And he said, that is God's whole plan and purpose for us, is for this leaning in, close, intimate relationship. He wants us to have to lean in very closely and intimately um, to be able to hear him. So what we're going to talk about this morning is how can we honestly hear what he has to say? What, what methods does he use to make it very practical and not just floaty out there like, well, he talks in a still small voice. He does talk in a still small voice, <laughs> but how do I even hear that still small voice? So we're going to get very practical and talk about five different ways that God uses to communicate clearly to us 
um, his plans, his purposes. If any of, has anybody in here ever taken the Alpha course or even heard of it? It's a basic course in Christianity, and, um, and one of the talks on that is, how does God guide us? So I'm going to use the Alpha outline. I'm just telling you that in case you're like, hey, I've heard this somewhere before. Um, and what, what they do is little alliteration tricks to help you remember. So each way is going to start with a CS. Um, just to, in the hopes that now when you're out there in the world and you're really trying to hear God, you might remember, oh yeah, here's some ways he speaks to us, okay? But before we jump into the actual practical ways, there really are a couple prerequisites, if you will, if you really want to hear from God. One is you you need to believe that he really does want to talk to you. You need to dispel <laughs> the wrong notions like I had that, well, I'm not part of the in crowd. You know what? You are all part of the in crowd. <laughs> God does not play favorites. He really doesn't. He's not a respecter of people. Like, oh, I'll, I'll talk to this person over here, but not this person. He adores every single person one of us in this room, unconditionally, without holding back, um, he loves you. A love relationship is a relationship of communication. He wants to hear from you a lot, and he does want to talk back to you. So you need to believe that he really wants to, and then you actually, actually really have to want to listen and obey. Because God doesn't play games with us, really. He's patient, he's kind, he's loving, but he's also very serious and very holy. And we really dare not play games with him and tell him, oh, I wanna hear you, I want your will, please lead me, please guide me but then have this inner attitude of, but really I'm gonna do whatever I want. <laughs> and I'm really only gonna obey, obey you if you tell me something good that I wanna do, right? right? You get what I'm saying? And, and the flesh part of us, we're like that. We're drawn to that. Um, but when you get serious back with God and realize how much he loves us, what a perfect, incredible plan he has for each individual life, then it kind of changes that, okay, I really do want to hear from you and up front I'm going to plan to obey as best as I'm able whatever you tell me to do okay so a couple little um, prerequisites a quote here um, Jim Cimbala he, he's a pastor up at the Brooklyn Tab in um, New York City he says this I might be ahead of my notes there but if you could put the, do I have that quote up there or am I just reading it Okay, I'm reading it. Jim Cimbala says this, our spiritual ear will never be sensitive to his voice if we have a personal agenda to which we are already committed. God leads and speaks to the humble who have surrendered their plans and want to do his will. With an open heaven and a surrendered will, we will be able to clearly hear God's voice in our hearts. Notice he says in our hearts, not our ears, <laughs> okay? Um, so wanting his will. We talked about that last night, surrendering the will. Um, Romans 12, 2, I think I have that verse up there, very clearly states, don't be conformed to this world. We talked about it last night. Again, don't set your mind on the things of the world and that let the world judge for you what's important and what's valuable and what your actions should or should not be. Don't be conformed to this world. Decide in advance that you want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that is then when you will be able to hear him. You'll be able to test and approve what his will really is for you personally. A beautiful picture of this kind of heart attitude 
is the Virgin Mary. If you think about her, she was like a 14-year-old teenager. And here this angel appears to her, and he's like, hey, here's a job that God has for you. You're going you're gonna to birth the Messiah. Now, she does ask him questions. She's like, how can this be? I'm a virgin. But the angel says a couple things to her. One, he tells her, look, don't be afraid. You are highly favored. And another thing he tells to her is, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. In other words, relax. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one who will actually do it. And Mary is like, okay. I'm his handmaiden, be it done unto me as he wills. Now, some of you might think, okay, well, I'm no Virgin Mary. <laughs> Trust me, I don't think God is gonna give me some big, you know, Virgin Mary assignment. We don't have a lot in common. <laughs> Trust me, I know. I'm like, oh, miss, miss that. Uh, but, but, but truthfully, when you think about what that angel told Mary, it really is what the New Testament writers are telling every single one of us ladies. The New Testament says that Jesus lavishes his grace upon us. And really what that means is favor. Unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. Ladies, God highly favors every single one of us in this room. That is amazing. That's exciting. You're highly favored. And two, when you are born again, the Holy Spirit overshadows you. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and literally equips you to do whatever task he is assigning you to. Um, so you have a lot in common with Mary. <laughs> there you go. Now, Many of us think, okay, well, I'm just like this plain person, and I, I have this level of intelligence or this background or this, you know, I don't know, I don't really have all those, these shining talents. And me? Does God want to use me? Yes. Every one of you is so valuable to the kingdom. He has placed things inside of you that he wants you to use and, and, and grow in you and get out there and, and be part of changing your world. Um, so yes, he wants to use you. Jeremiah says this, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Sometimes when people think about God having an assignment for them, they're like, oh, no, 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 I am not going to Africa. You know, and they think he's going to ruin my life if I really surrendered because he's going to make me do something terrible. That's crazy. He loves you. He adores you. He is not out to ruin your life. He's out to give you a future and a hope and never, ever harm you. Um, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, you are God's masterpiece. He created you anew in Christ Jesus so that you can do the good things he planned for you long ago. In other words, you're saved by Jesus Christ from your sins, not by your good works at all, but you are saved unto good works. You are saved not so you can sit back and be a fat cat and have, you know, bless me, bless me, Lord. That's not why you're saved. You're saved so that you will transform and grow and then get out there and do the good works that he actually already has planned. I love that thought. He's got those good works planned. All you got to do is walk in them. Now, again, early on, when I'm reading this verse, I'm like, oh, great. How am I supposed to figure out what those good works are? And what if I'm over here doing this good work that seemed appealing, but it wasn't the good work that you planned beforehand? I'm very confused, Lord. 
I'm very confused. Could you make it clear? Could you talk to me? And again, that's, we're, we're going we're gonna to get some clarity here. But for those of you who are sitting here going, OK, OK, but me, I still think I'm too, and then fill in the blank. I'm too old, like April. I'm too, <laughs> where'd she go? <laughs> oh, good, she's out of the room. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> She will get me for that. <laughs> or <laughs> I'll confess later, April. Or some of you might think I'm too young. Or some of you might think I'm too, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Well, Rick Warren writes in his Purpose Driven Life this little um, paragraph that combats that thinking. Abraham was old. Jacob, insecure. Leah, unattractive, Joseph had been abused, Moses stuttered, Gideon was poor, Samson codependent, Rahab immoral, David had had an affair and all kinds of family problems, Elijah was suicidal, Jeremiah depressed, Jonah reluctant, Naomi a widow, John the Baptist eccentric to say the least, <laughs> Peter impulsive and hot tempered, Martha worried a lot, the Samaritan woman had had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had poor health. Timothy was timid. A variety of misfits. And God used each of them in his service. <laughs> so if you have those feelings of insecurity, you're in good company, OK? I loved what April started the conference with. We all are odd. Okay, we're all awkward. Um, let's celebrate that. We're unique, but that doesn't not in any way, shape, or form exclude any of us from walking in these good works and carrying out God's plans. Um, now, sometimes people think, well, kind of like me, like, well, what if I mess up? I mean, is these these plans that He's already prepared beforehand? Is it like? like a blueprint and I've got to follow it very carefully and what if I get it wrong and like I said I'm over here instead of he is so big <laughs> so gracious so kind so patient he truly wants us to know his will even more than we want to and um, somebody said that to me when I was young Katie relax <laughs> he is able to guide you. You do not have to be freaked out about chasing after. Um, and, and the idea, and I'm sure you've heard this analogy, um, it breaks down, but it's a good one, a GPS. When you are trying to get somewhere and the GPS is leading you and guiding you, sometimes you don't want to obey that GPS because you doubt it, right? You're like, this can't possibly be right. I think I'm going to get off here and go in a direction that I think is going to get me there in a better way, right? Now, the GPS does not start screaming at you, you idiot, why, you know? <laughs> OK, great. Now you're really lost, and I'm not going to help you because you've gone off the path. You ruined the whole trip. No, the GPS is like, OK. Re recalculating, you know, or whatever they say. Now I um, turn here, do you know? And um, and God will absolutely lead you and guide you because we do all make mistakes. But He gently will get you back on the right path. Okay, so God says clearly. I don't know what the reference for this next verse is. Psalms, thank you. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Ladies, this is one of those you should just memorize and hang on tight to so that when you have those doubts, when you have that, you know, it, you can just repeat his word. He will. He will. God is not a liar. He doesn't put stuff in his Bible and then... Oh, yeah, just kidding. No, it's in there, and he means it. He will instruct us. 
How? How? How, how, how? Okay, so we're going to um, talk about how, five CSs. What we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the first two first, and then we're going to take a break, and you guys will talk around your tables and kind of share stories of if, if you had ever possibly been led in that way, shape, or form. Um, by God, share your own stories, and then we'll come back and do the, the last three, and then we'll have lunch. Sound like a plan? Okay, so the first two, to me, really are the absolute major ways God speaks to us now in this age. Because in Hebrews, it says something like, in, in former days, in the past, God spoke through the prophets in a variety of ways, at various ways at various times. So in the Old Testament, God had not made his spirit available to everyone on the inside. He would come upon particular people for particular times, for particular tasks, but the majority of people, uh, all their communication with God was, was on the outside. The Ten Commandments, the, um, he, he would speak to people through, uh, he spoke to one guy through a donkey, if you remember that. <laughs> he would <laughs> speak through, you know, spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He would um, kind of lead and guide through a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He would um, speak through the prophets. He'd give the prophets a message and then they would go speak to the people. But it was, it was always on the outside. But then Hebrews says that was in the last days. In these days, he speaks to us through his son. So these days literally means the church age, the days that started when Jesus Christ was resurrected and that will end with his second coming. That, that, that is these days that he's referring to. And God speaks to his people now through his son. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, Jesus Christ sends his spirit. Remember when he left, he said, you're going you're gonna to actually be happy when I leave the earth because I'm going to send you another like me, the helper, the comforter, who will actually indwell you. So you have the spirit of Christ in you to talk to you in that still small voice, but then you also have the word. If you remember in John, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so the two primary actual practical ways he talks to us now is through his word, commanding scripture, that's your CS, and through his indwelling Holy Spirit, the compelling spirit. Those are the two major ways. So, commanding scripture. The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, the word of God will guide you one step at a time. Obviously, you have to be in the word. <laughs> you have to be reading it in order to let it be a, a light and a lamp. But here's the thing about the word of God. It reveals the general will of God for every single Christ follower, everything, every single God believer. It reveals his general will. And what his general will is for us, ladies, truthfully, is way more about who we are than about what we actually do. Because who you are inside is the impetus for how you act. And so his general will is that we are in relationship with him and that we are becoming more and more like Christ every single day, uh, embracing Christ's values and becoming like him. That's his general will for everybody. But then he, he does reveal his general will about a lot of specifics in our lives. He talks a lot about relationships, he talks a lot about marriage, he talks a lot about sexuality, he talks a lot about money. So there is a ton of stuff that you don't even have to ask him. Guide me, guide me, what's your will? Get in the Bible and you'll know. Um, for example, if you are here and you are married and yet you see this other hot guy who is not your husband and you're like, oh, I wonder if it would be God's will if I just had a little affair with that guy. You don't have to pray about that. Scripture says, do not commit adultery. 
there's, how do you argue with that? You don't need guidance, it's right there. No, not healthy. Should I cheat on my taxes? It's right in scripture. Pay taxes to whom taxes are due. This Alpha course, there was a guy who became a Christian during the course, and he wrote this letter <laughs> to the IRS in England. They're probably not called the IRS over there, but you know, the tax people in England. He says, Dear Sir, I have just become a Christian, and I have found that I cannot sleep at night. So here's 100 pounds that I owe you. P.S. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> so, so God's will, God's general will is, is revealed. And we get that, but we're like, yeah, but what about the specifics? What about the specifics? Can he guide me through his word about specific things in my life? Have Absolutely. If you'll patiently keep yourself in scripture and keep yourself expecting him to bring some kind of revelation to you about things. And there's a million examples of this, but I'll just give you one. <laughs> um, I told you a little bit about starting this new podcast. Um, so back it up, last summer we t I took this Beth Moore Bible study called Entrusted and it was studying the book of 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy. I didn't study it very well, but um, <laughs> one of those books. But the whole point of the, the study was, you have been entrusted with the gospel, and you have been equipped to get out there and share it. And so um, I prayed, God, make me better at what you've called me to do. I know you've called me to share the gospel and get it out there. Would you, would you just make me better at it? Well, the very next week, this friend of mine who's way younger, kind of like April, is, no, no, she's still not here. I'm trying to. <laughs> She says to me, um, she invites me to go to this conference with her, and I didn't even really know what the conference was about, but I'm like, sure, I like conferences. It turned out to be about podcasting. And she's like, Katie, hey, I think you and I should start a podcast. I'm like, no, that's crazy. I don't even know what a podcast is. And she's like, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I see that really it's like a radio show, like an old-fashioned radio show where you just interview people and you just blab. And so... Um, we talk about it and talk about it, and I'm like, Susan, I don't know. I got a lot on my plate already. I'm kind of old, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, maybe you be the personality and I'll be your manager, you know, all this. Okay. But she's like, just be open to it. I think I really convinced. Okay, so I'm in my room and I am talking to God about it all. And I'm like, okay, God, look. And I recited all those things. I, I don't know. I'm kind of old. I'm kind of busy. I, I'm not really a good extemporaneous talker. I spend a lot of time with notes and planning and reading and preparing what to say. And, and so I'm giving him all these excuses why I am not a good candidate <laughs> to be on a podcast. And then I stopped because I like to practice what I preach. And I'm like, okay, I need to hear from you. This is, this is a big decision. I really need to hear from you, Lord. Well, I, what I was, one of the things I was doing for my quiet time daily was reading through the story by Max Lucado. If any of you have, I can see some heads nodding. The story is really the Bible in novel form. And so it's all in chronological order. And forgive me, Lord, but Max Lucado took out the boring parts and then just kind of summarize them so that it reads like a novel. Okay, so um, a bunch of us were reading through that. So I picked it up, and I wasn't hunting through scripture for some random word. I just picked it up from where I left off the day before. It was the story of Moses where God tells Moses from the burning bush, look, I want you to go to Egypt, and Moses argues with God five times. Me, 
you know, and, it, it, and gives all these excuses. I know, I couldn't believe it. It was like, okay. The very last um, argument, God says, all right, all right, go get your brother Aaron. And then he literally, it, the verse literally says, I will show you to what to do, and I will tell you to what to say. You talk about scripture jumping off the page, communicating something very personally that I had humbly really had asked. And I said, okay, done, finished, thank you. He guided me, and then we, we started this podcast. It's a little crazy, but it's been cool, and it's reaching way more people than me trying to go around just speaking inter intermittently. You know what I mean? Because I had asked him, help me be better at what you're calling me to do. Yeah, so that's how that works. Um, I talked a little bit, oh, and this is that book. I'm gonna put this over there too if anybody wants a copy of this, it really is good. Okay, um, one, <laughs> one warning, and I'm sure you guys have heard somebody say this. Sometimes people want like instant direction from God. They don't want to take the time to actually develop a relationship because that takes time. And, they, and they're not in the word daily, but yet they got a big decision to make and they want guidance. So they take the Bible. Can I use your, your Bible? So they'll be like, okay, I need guidance. Guide me. Use your word. And then they close their eyes and they go, mm. <laughs> have you heard this? And, they, and the guy is like, ooh, Judas went and hung himself. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, okay, well, let me try again, you know. <laughs> go and do likewise. <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay, this isn't like a magic <laughs> Again, what God is after is a relationship, an intimate relationship with him. So it takes time and patience and being in the word and then just sincerely asking and saying, I want to I wanna hear. Okay, so that is commanding scripture, and that's how he guides us through his word. Now, the second way is through the compelling spirit. And the word um, compelling in Acts, um, Paul says, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Now, truthfully, when you read the New Testament, being led by the Holy Spirit literally is like the actual definition of a Christ follower. <laughs> because like in the Gospel of Luke, Luke talks over and over about how Jesus Christ himself was led by the Holy Spirit. And then Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and it's almost like he is showing the same Holy Spirit that led Jesus Christ while he was here on earth is, is now leading the church. And then in, in essence, every single member of that church is being led by the Holy Spirit. Um, The problem is, you, you're like, okay, I get it. I know he's in there. It's a still small voice, but I got my own voice in there too. And then what about Satan and demons and their voices and um, people and their voices that get inside my head? How do I know the difference between the Holy Spirit, me, whatever? Truthfully, Part of it is just time and starting to recognize his voice. Like if you think of people, when you don't know someone, if they called you on the phone and just started talking, when I worked at this church, there was this man that would just, I'd say hello and he would just start, obviously this is before cell phones and voice recognition and everything, but he would just start talking. I'd be like, who are you? What? The more I worked there and the more he called, the more I was able to recognize, oh, this is Jim Slanis, you know? <laughs> if your husband calls you, you don't need to say, who are you again, you know? Are you sure it's you, you know? Because you know him, you're intimate with him, 
you recognize his voice. Um, Jesus says in, in John, my sheep, let me find that. My sheep, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, don't let this freak you out, ladies, if you're new to this. Um, I was freaked out. I'm like, maybe I'm not really a sheep. Maybe I'm one of his goats. Because I, again, I, I didn't hear his voice. I'm like, Ooh. relax. It's just saying you will more and more grow into the ability to really recognize, yes, this is the Holy Spirit. And then there's tests and ways you can kind of test. Um, but practically, how it works itself out then to listen to his voice is first and foremost through prayer. Now, some of you might be wondering, why, why do we have these little kids' books to give to you about prayer? Um, Truthfully, I think I learned more about the Bible and prayer and simple doctrinal things um, by teaching my kids, you know, because I was really a new believer when I started having kids. And so to be able to read like a children's Bible, I'm like, oh, that's Noah and the ark. I, okay, I get it, you know. And so there's this foundation that gives free books to uh, military people. And so when I tell them, you know, I'm coming close to a military base and they'll give me free books for everybody. And um, so I saw this kid's book on prayer. I'm like, bingo, perfect. Please no, I'm not insulting your intelligence. Like, well, here. <laughs> I thought, it's simple. Many of you have kids. You can read it to your kids or you have grandkids. It's precious. But it's just simple about prayer because prayer is truly the most important activity we can do because it really is the one thing uh, it, between scripture and it, that builds that relationship, okay? So um, in Acts, it says, as they were worshiping the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Sometimes today we think of worship only as singing music, but worship really is just giving him your time, your attention, your focus. It can be through music. Um, but as they were worshiping, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And that's the idea of getting alone, getting quiet, it, singing maybe, but ha and having your Bible open, and then expecting him to speak in some way, shape, or form to you. Um, it, the need for this, let me give you an analogy. If you, if you had pro health problems and you went to a doctor and you sat there and you told the doctor all your symptoms, would you then just get up and say, okay, see ya, and leave the room? Or would you actually want to wait <laughs> to have the doctor <laughs> Talk back to you, right? And say, okay, well, this is what I think is wrong, and here's what you can do to get better. But sometimes we treat God, and we run into his presence, and we're like, God, oh, this, that. We got all these problems. And then we're like, okay, see ya. And, and we're out of there. And he's like, oh, I could have actually given you <laughs> some guidance if you had stuck around and expected me to, to talk back to you. Okay, now again, how? How? I can't hear him. If you just kind of slow down, maybe journaling helps. And journaling is not like keeping a diary. I used to think it was like keeping a diary. And then I'm like, yesterday I ate lunch at Panera. You know, I'm like, this is boring. Who cares? And then I just give up. It's not a diary. It's it's just trying to freely write something that maybe God has taught you in the scripture you just read. Maybe you've heard a sermon and it keeps bubbling up within you a certain point that a speaker made. Um, do, you know what I'm saying? Or you saw something on Facebook, <laughs> that script, whatever. And, and then you're just letting your pen kind of flow with your thoughts. And then later, sometimes you'll look back at that journaling and you'll be like, wow, God really gave me some direction. I don't know, does that help at all? Journaling maybe, um, reading scripture with the expectation of hearing from him 
when I expect it, he will drop things like that, Moses, like I will show you too. If I'm reading scripture just to hurry up and check the box, like, oh, got to be in the word. And I'm quick, 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 and not expecting to hear anything, then usually, I mean, it's still beneficial, but, but I, you know, I won't get anything personal. So come at it with the expectation. Um, so that is one way the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our quiet times, through prayer, through journaling, and, and we can listen to him. Now, another way the Holy Spirit guides us is through an inner desire to do something. Um, in Philippians, it says this, it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, when he wants you to do something, when he has a good work that he has planned beforehand, and he really wants you to do that, he will start working on the inside of you um, with your desires. Mark Batterson in his whisper book calls them promptings or nudges. He will like nudge you. Um, Bill Hybels talks about a sensation within us that is like a, a, a holy dissatisfaction. Like you start feeling this I, with whatever you're doing, you're, you're just kind of dissatisfied and you're like, do you have something different for me, Lord? Is there something if, is there something new? Are you nudging me? Um, and then Mark tells the story of um, David Wilkerson. Some of you will remember him. This was way, way back in the day. But David Wilkerson was a pastor in a rural church in Pennsylvania. And he had a nice ministry in a nice church. And, you know, but he started getting really, like, restless, discontented, like, I don't know. And he didn't know. And he's like, Lord. So one day he's reading Life magazine. And there is a picture of these seven teenagers who had committed murder, gang murder, in New York City. And David Wilkerson could not get the picture of those seven teens out of his mind. And one in particular, the meanest, hardest, that boy's face was burned into David Wilkerson's mind. And he just wept. And then he felt this nudge. Go to New York City and help those boys. And he's like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's huge to go from being a pastor of a rural in, to New York City to work with gang members. Well, long story short, from that nudge, David Wilkerson goes, he meets the seven, and the one in particular that was so mean, his name was Nikki Cruz, and David Wilkerson led Nikki Cruz to the Lord, and then they wrote this book called The Cross and the Switchblade, and it became a national bestseller, and it was turned into a movie, and the gospel was shared nationwide through this incredible story, and then he started Times Square Church right there in New York City, and he had an amazing, impactful ministry here on earth. Ladies, the Holy Spirit will nudge you, will give you desires, will give you a restlessness to move you into something he wants you to do. Now, sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it, it, it's not like a, a comfortable desire, like, oh, yay, I get to go to New York City and work with gang members, you know. But it's a compelling desire. It's like Nikki Cruz did not, it's not like in the flesh he wanted to go, but he couldn't say no. So that is how God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit in that kind of mysterious way, through putting his will in you to do something. Does that, does that make sense? And I'm hoping some of you might have some stories to share around the table as to how the Holy Spirit has done that in your own life. Um, because there's all kinds of crazy stories about that. Now, in, to wrap this up, there are a myriad of other ways the Holy Spirit can talk to a person. 
He can give visions, dreams, prophecies, um, other miraculous signs. He could send an angel. I mean, there's all kinds of like more miraculous supernatural ways. Absolutely, he does that in the world today. But the problem with that is it's a bit tricky. <laughs> and you could really get off base if that was your only way. And you've heard some people, haven't you? I mean, the Twin Towers. Oh, God told them to fly airplanes into the Twin Towers. Really? Yeah, don't think that was God. God is a God of love. He is never, ever going to give someone a vision or a dream or a, it, to lead them to do something absolutely violent and awful. That people blame God for all kinds of things. Scripture says, test the spirits. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. So if you have some kind of dream or vision, don't go out the next day and go, done. This is God. Test it. It might have been the pizza you ate, okay? <laughs> Before going to bed, you might, you know. I mean, you know what I mean. You can't take those. You got to test those. Now, can, can he give you those? Of course, but test them. And if we had more time, I'd tell you all kinds of crazy stories of things people told me. Oh, God told me to tell you this. Really? You know, it, mm. it didn't fit the criteria. Scripture says, test the spirits. It says, is it strengthening? Is it encouraging? Is it comforting? Um, and some other things. Does the peace of Christ rule in your heart? That is a test, but that doesn't mean it, the peace of Christ ruling in your heart does not mean there's not some anxiety to the calling. Because truthfully, most of the time when he does call you to do some kind of job, it's not that peaceful. It's kind of like, ah, you know. But the peace of Christ is just finally that certainty that, yes, this, this is God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go forward and trust. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so one last analogy, and then um, we are going to end with just a little a clip because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Here, here's an analogy from um, Evans. What's his name? Tony Evans. Football, and, and it's about um, how does God use commanding scripture and the compelling spirit together for this day and age to lead and guide us, okay? Football games function based on objective rules that govern how the game operates. Yet, each team has the freedom to call specific plays based on changing situations. In similar manner, God's objective word is the fixed standard by which we all live. The role of the Holy Spirit, like a divine play caller, is to provide individual guidance based on the changing realities of life, always based on God's unchanging word. Just as a team's individual strategy must operate within the fixed rules of the game, the Spirit's voice will always operate within the boundaries of God's revealed word. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, has anybody ever seen the movie called All Saints? I'm going to I'm going to show this little trailer that'll give you the gist of it and what I want you to recognize is a true this is based on a true story of a man who feels like he's been nudged by the Holy Spirit to do something. He's trying to defend it and people think he's a little crazy. <laughs> but he defends it by scripture like well here's what scripture says to do so it makes sense to do this. Um, but then things don't work out. And then somebody else challenges him, well, if God told you to do this, why didn't he make it work out? But by the end of the movie, you see, oh, it worked out. But it worked out what God had in mind, not what man had in mind. And it was beautiful, and it's a true story. You should see the whole movie, but just watch this trailer. Dear friends in Christ, the Reverend Michael Spurlock. We didn't meet before, I'm Michael. You didn't sell the church, ain't you? The fact is, you had 12 people in that church today. Jesus had 12 people. He done all right, didn't he? A new pastor's first assignment 
to close a struggling church. Michael, you're not here to perform CPR. If passing out a few flyers helps my congregation feel they can let their church go, I'm gonna do it. Refugees searching to find a new home. We have 15 new family, not enough food for their children. Well, here's the thing, Yi Wen. We're closing the church, we're broke. Well, what is broke? Together, they'll risk it all for hope. We will plant a garden, very good ground and all things. What do you think will happen to them when we leave? Let's keep them in our prayers and ask for God's help. Aren't you God's help? I think God spoke to me. What did he say? He said, I've given you land, I've given you farmers. Do the math. He said, do the math. He wants us to save this little church by making the land into a farm. That voice you hear, be sure it's God's voice, not your own. And people are not here to pick your beans, they're here to be Americans. What's more American than farming? Start a farm, we work together, and save the church. Amen. Hey, How you gonna plow? It's funny you should mention that. You're blowing your boss's chance at a big sale here, preacher. You risked our careers on this. You swore an oath as a minister to God, not to me, to obey, even when you disagree. You swore an oath as a Christian to care for the least of these. This whole thing, it's not some ego trip I'm on, is it? I thought I knew the will of God. Is it his voice I heard or was it mine? Look back where we started. I want to show you something. We are not where we started. We're somewhere completely new. Now that I have your attention, before I talk about the raffles, <laughs> I just really quick again want to talk about the fundraiser we have May 12th. Some of you might not know what Food for Life is. Food for Life serves the community of 29 Palms as well as Wonder Valley. Every Saturday, they meet at the Church of the Nazarene and they serve not only our homeless community, but anybody who's in need. They also deliver, deliver emergency food and they deliver bread to our seniors and our low income once a week. And they need help because anybody who's serving others needs help. So our fundraiser that we're gonna do May 12th, the tickets, like I said, are $5. That pays for you to get in, it pays for you to have entertainment, it pays for your lunch, but then there's also gonna be extra tickets you can purchase, and all of that money that you use those tickets to purchase are gonna to go to Food for Life. And then you'll use those tickets to bid on whatever raffles you wanna win. And like I said, there's some really amazing stuff. So this is a great thing. And this, the greatest thing about Food for Life every Saturday, a different church in our community is responsible for cooking the food. So this is the time when all these churches get together and we say, hey, there's a need in the community. Let's combine forces and let's all work together for the good of our community, which is a wonderful thing. So May 12th, it's in your flyers. Mark it. If you want to buy a ticket before you leave, come see me after the conference and let me know. And you can also buy tickets at the door for that. Yay! Yay, Food for Lifers! You can also buy tickets at the door for that. You don't have to buy them in advance, but it really, hear me, my party planner heart, it helps me if you buy early because <laughs> I can plan and it helps Joe to plan how much she's going to make for food wise and stuff. But I understand too, if you can't decide to last minute, just come and give us your money. Just come. <laughs> just come. Or just drop off a donation. That's right. Okay. So Lauren, where's Lauren? I literally just asked her to help me. Where'd she go? Shame on her. Okay, she'll be back. I know she will. She's a worker bee. So let's do the posters first. Yes? You guys ready? Laura, will you come up here, please? Yep. She's been my friend for like eight years, so I have the right to embarrass her a little bit. Laura is the one who took those beautiful pictures out in the desert. She's an amazing photographer, and she suffered a cactus spur in the butt to get these photos for y'all. So, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so she can draw for us. The winner of number one, April Medina. April Medina. So what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the number one on the back of this and then after the conference, that's your claim ticket. 
to get the number one, okay? All right. Number two. Joyce Bogan. Okay, so put the number two on there. Number three. Nicole Schaefer. Nicole Schaefer. Woo -hoo! Brittany Murphy. We'll put her name, we'll put her number on it. That's okay. <laughs> did you put your name in one? Yes. You did? Number four. <laughs> Sharon Heppel? Yay! Yay! <laughs> Good job, Sharon. Wow, you guys filled these. I didn't know if people would want to take those or not because I didn't. I mean, they're beautiful. I just didn't know, like, how I had my toy. <laughs> well, hurry up. But it has to be one that's already passed. <laughs> She's like, what are we doing right now? How are these names being drawn? You can either choose si six, seven, or eight. Hurry up. Six, seven, or eight. One of the two. <laughs> okay. Alisa Allen? Alyssa Allen. <laughs> yeah. Mahalo. <laughs> Number seven. Sorry, I stopped holding the bag for you. <laughs> Laurel Morrow? Laurel Morrow. And the last one, number eight, which is one of my favorites. Oh, by the way, a little known fact, <laughs> because why would you know? Um, a lot of these ones were taken at the Oasis of Mara like three days before it burned. So these are probably the last images that those trees will ever look like that. So that's pretty special. Desiree Valenzuela. Desiree, where are you? Good job. All right, so those are your claim tickets. They're up here on the stage. Before you leave, we'll get the ladder out, and we'll give those into you and roll them up. All right. Ma'am. Katie, will you join me for the books? Will you pull the book tickets? I'll say the number you pull it. Because Lauren left me. You want to help too over here? <laughs> Can I say a word about these books? Yeah. Um, this is why these books are even here. <laughs> when I speak and try to write, you know, sessions, I spend a couple months kind of marinating in the theme, and I read a million books. But the problem is then, I'm like, well, Lord, I, I, I can't say all this. <laughs> There's too much. So this, this is the first time I've ever done this. I thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy all these, a copy of every one of these books, and then pray over them. And then if there is a woman here that needs that particular subject to hear more about, then God could direct you to win, okay? So if you win, you better read it because it is God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the first one is Whisper. And as we call these off, you guys can come up. So just be prepared with your, with your ticket. The number is 368-113. All right, come on up and grab it. The next one, Discerning the Voice of God. Three seven eight eight one four. So come on up. The next one, more than a carpenter. We have one, two, three, four, five, six of these to give away. The first one is three seven eight eight zero six. Three six eight one three four. Three six eight one five eight. Three seven eight eight zero zero. More than carpenters, you can just steal it. 
368-118. Grab one. Hey, we kind of look. 368-139. So just come on up. Your ticket number is in front of the book. Grab it. <laughs> Nobody wants that one. Somebody's going to have that for free. <laughs> All right. The next one is the cross and the switchblade. That is 378-829. The next one is You Are Free, the Rebecca Lyons book. 368-107. Holy, Holy in the moment. Three six eight one one five. Do any of you know Ginger Harrington? She's a fellow Marine wife, and she's the one that wrote that holy in the moment. So I thought it was fitting to bring bring a book by a Marine wife. There you go. <laughs> All right, what's the next one? What do you have? Um, was that from that? That was that. Yeah. Ooh, the, emotion the emotionally healthy woman. Don't we all want that? <laughs> <laughs> Three seven eight. 807. Experiencing God day by day. This is one of the best ones. I love experiencing God. I would love to. 368 119. The next one is the story, and that is. Okay. 378-821. Laurel Morrow. Wrote her name on the back. She wanted to make sure. And our last one, the imperfect woman. That's all of us, right? Amen. Can I get an amen? 368-169. Yay! God is all over you. All Lucy. right. Good job, ladies. Congratulations, winners. We're going to go into our last session. Totally trust you. We're going to go into our last session of the afternoon. When her session's done, um, we're going to end in worship. I'll just speak really quick to end us out in prayer after Katie's done with her session before we do worship and let you know how it's going to go after that. And then we'll be done with the conference. And again, like I said when I sent out the messages, we'll keep the doors open till 2. I know there's some of you who still want to talk to Katie. She's going to be here till 2. There might be breakdown and stuff going on around you around 1.30. But please just stay in fellowship, especially if you need prayer or you need to talk to somebody or you just are having a good time enjoying yourself. Oh. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Boy, that lunch break went fast. This whole day has gone fast. I can't believe it's almost, it's almost over. Um, oh, I need another book before I... Just stretch, ladies. Oh, my speaker. Thank you. Sorry, ladies. I need... Who just won that imperfect book? Can I borrow it? Oh, wait, here's my copy. Okay, here we go. Our theme verse that we've been unpacking, um, I put it up here on this first slide in a different version. I think it's the message. Um, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert, be present, I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road in the desert, rivers in the badlands. Um, some versions say streams in the desert. When I first um, got sent to 29 Palms, the group of friends, as a going away gift, gave me a devotional called Streams in the Desert. Has anybody ever uh, heard of that devotional? Beautiful. Such words of refreshment to my soul. When I, when I think of desert or wastelands, or badlands, you, you think of dry and dusty and, and thirsty and the need for refreshment. 
Well, listen to what Jesus Christ says about providing for that thirst. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then the gospel writer who, who wrote down those words that Jesus said, says, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So when Jesus Christ was promising, if you're thirsty and you trust and believe in me, you will never thirst again and rivers of living water will flow from you. What he meant by that was, I am going to put my Holy Spirit into you to refresh you, to empower you, and then he will be the one to flow out of you, in a sense. But here's what happens. We, we get saved, we kind of get God the Father and God the Son. But when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, a lot of times we're kind of ignorant. We don't, we just don't get it that much, this, the Spirit. We just don't, we don't understand maybe um, as much about the Holy Spirit and how he is the provision to actually be able to live this Christian life that we're called to. And so we're under the impression and the illusion that we have to figure this new life out on our own and we have to live it in our own strength. Um, this, this book, An Imperfect Woman, I, I met this gal and she's amazing, but her story is she was raised in a Christian home and godly parents, went to a Christian school, Christian college, married her, her, you know, love of her life, and then they went on to have six kids and five boys and one girl. But she says somewhere along the line, she inadvertently picked up the notion that she had to perform. She had to work out her own sanctification, her own, you know, growing in holiness by her own strength, her own power, and things kind of had to be perfect, or she was letting God down. She, she was kind of a, a perfectionist, and when things would go wrong, then she just felt crushed and worthless. Let me just even read to you a little bit of her story, if I can find, here it is. As each child joined our family, I decided not only to carry the responsibility of my own sanctification, but also to take charge of sanctifying my children's souls as well. <laughs> Anybody else in here <laughs> do that? The years flew by as they tend to do. I was living my dream and I knew it, but why was it so hard? We homeschooled, Jeff was an elder, I taught Bible studies, I kept a ridiculously clean house for a family of eight, and I yelled a whole lot at my kids. <laughs> I was a Bible-toting, church-going, song-singing, hard-striving young wife and mother. For all of my striving, we were doing okay. I was stressed out all the time. My oldest son and I argued constantly, and our second son was running away. But we were okay, because we homeschooled. My husband was an elder. I taught Bible studies. And the house was clean most of the time. <laughs> and Emily, Emily said, yes, ma'am. Taught Bible studies to her little friends in the neighborhood helped me all the time, was a leader, an example among her peers, and loved Jesus wholeheartedly. She also had nowhere to go with the reality of her sin. Emily had embraced the same striving, try-hard life as her mother and was a really good girl. 
When it came to my only daughter, I felt successful. Until the day I walked into her room unexpected and discovered Emily was cutting. It looked like a cat had attacked her stomach. Had you told me that my sweet little 13-year-old daughter was cutting, I would have said you were crazy. Emily said, yes, ma'am, taught Bible studies and truly loved Jesus wholeheartedly. Cutting wasn't part of my plan. We went on to discover that Emily was deeply depressed and had an eating disorder. My world crumbled. It crumbled not because I loved Em more than her brothers, but because I felt like she was the one I was getting it right with. And now I'd failed with her too. And I gave up. I kept going through the motions, but my heart wasn't in it. How could I work so stinking hard and still fail so profoundly as a mom? The helplessness and lack of control I felt were paralyzing. As a mother, you will do anything to protect your children. But what do you do when their enemy is themselves? My mind was frantic, but every strategy and fix I could conceive came up to a dead end. I would lie in bed at night begging God to protect Emily from herself, begging him to fix us. My heart was breaking. What I didn't know was that in my desperation, God was breaking the back of perfectionism in my life. My life's greatest failure would become the means of my freedom. In his wisdom, love, and mercy, God had begun to sabotage my strategies. This just touched me profoundly because you can feel that woman's pain and just kind of with, with some inadvertent bad theology, she had to do it all in her own strength. And ladies, when we do that, eventually we will become a wasteland and we will start maybe still going through the motions, showing up at church. People ask how you are. Oh, fine. Praise God. But honest, <laughs> you're like, just let me get home, <laughs> you know. Um, and we're dry and we're in a wasteland. What Kim in this book goes on to basically say is God had to show her. <laughs> it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You can't live the Christian life, ladies, without the power of the Holy Spirit because it is he that does it. And, um, but again, Oftentimes, we just, we just don't understand. Um, we don't understand. It, Priscilla Shire, that book, Discerning the Voice of God, whoever got that one, that's a great one. Um, she says this, using your own grit and personal resolution to force changes in your behavior is not only exhausting to maintain, but nearly always proves to be nothing more than a temporary fix. Inevitable relapses turn up into a never-ending cycle of disappointment, frustration, self-hatred, along with other unhealthy emotions. Can anybody relate to this? You try hard, 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 and you, you fail, and then you're like, I hate myself, I'm an idiot. Um, lasting change. The kind that frees you to walk with ryth rhythms of grace fueled by the power of God must stem from the inside, not the outside. Despite your sinful deficiencies, which e each of us shares, trust yourself to his care and cooperate with him in the ways he has instructed. The DNA is there. Trust him to fashion your behaviors in the image of Christ. And then she quotes 1 Thessalonians. We've seen this verse before, but let's put it up there. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. And again, that word sanctify means to set apart, make holy. May God do that 
completely for you. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Do you see anything in there that says, ladies, be perfect, work hard, you got to be perfect. He will surely do it. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit will empower you to have different desires, to have different thoughts, to have different equipping and gifts and abilities to walk out this Christian life. It's like, it's like the pressure is off, ladies, if you can grab a hold of, uh, of this idea. Um, so Priscilla Shire goes on to say, in order to get your whole being in alignment, able to hear God and obey him, able to hear God and obey him across all systems and structures, spirit, soul, and body, we should maintain the posture that I once heard a missionary to Africa describe. And what she says is this, this guy would get up in the morning and he would treat his bed like an altar. And he would just lay across the bed quickly in a posture like this. And he would say, I surrender. I surrender all. Remember that old hymn we used to sing? I surrender all to Jesus. All to him I freely give. I will ever trust and love him, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> can't remember the rest, but we sing it, I surrender all, but do we really mean it? And do we really surrender all and say, I, I can't, but you can. When I am weak, you are strong. You need to empower me. Um, the Apostle Paul, in his wisdom and, of course, divine inspiration, he prayed for the Ephesian Christians, and, and then in effect, for all Christians through all ages, this, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, in that mind, soul, will, spirit, conscience, strengthened with power through his spirit, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, he was, he's praying this for Christians. He's not praying it for non-Christians to, to invite Christ in. He's praying for Christians to actually let Christ rule your heart, rule, rule your mind, rule your will, rule your emotions. Literally dwell there. Be perfectly at home in your inner being. Um, he says, and that you then, being rooted and grounded in love, next slide, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, surpasses what you know facts about him, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's, um, oh, and one more. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. And the fact that the Apostle Paul had to pray that for all of us, I, I mean, it just shows it's kind of a universal thing that we're not going to just immediately understand the Holy Spirit and that that is where we receive our power and enablement, enablement and giftedness to walk out um, this life. A lot of times, and especially in our culture today, a lot of churches, they got the Father, they got the Son, and they got the Bible. And the Holy Spirit is like, <laughs> why don't we just not talk much about him? Francis Chan wrote a whole book called The Forgotten God. And it kind of talking about this phenomenon in evangelical circles today that a lot of people don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit because they don't want weirdness, you know. And, and there's mystery to the Spirit. Um, 
But bottom line, without the spirit, you have no power to live this life and you're gonna shrivel up. Um, my own self, again, I could picture the father, kind of. I could picture the son. We heard a lot about Jesus Christ. But when it came to talking about the Holy Spirit, I would picture maybe Casper, the friendly ghost, with a little halo, you know, floating around, smiling and being nice to people. Or I would be like, that's a little spooky. So I just wouldn't even think about the Holy Spirit. But every single Sunday, we would say this little thing about him as part of the, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. And we would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. I said that every single Sunday. So in my mind, I understood that the Holy Spirit was equal with God the Father and God the Son, and that he was deity. So when I got saved, and one of the first Bible studies I went to, this woman just casually mentioned that the Holy Spirit lived inside of us. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> He's God. You're saying God lives in me? She's like, yeah. I said, well, why am I not amazing then? <laughs> and, and then I said, so does God live in every Christian? She's like, yeah, if they're born again, he does. I said, why aren't our churches amazing? Why aren't our churches havens of joy and love and peace and, and miracles? If God lives in all these people, why aren't we collectively amazing? Well, the reality is, because even though we all have the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily have all of us. He doesn't enter in and then automatically take over like now we're a little robot and he's the controlling center. He comes in and you, when you are saved, you have all of him that you need. You don't need to like, down the road, get a little bit more like, oh, I only got part of you. Can you give me more? You know, you have all of him when you get saved that you need. But understanding how you surrender to him is a different ball of wax. Um, Beth Moore describes it like this. Let me just read what she says so I do it right. Um, there's a verse in Ephesians that says, um, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that verb tense is in the present tense, and it means keep on continually being filled. It's not talking about the one-time filling that happens when you're born again. It talks about the necessity for born-again Christians to keep on continually being filled with the Spirit. Okay, so what does that mean? And I love the way Beth Moore describes it. She says, I don't think I put the whole quote up there, I just put the end of it. So let me tell you the beginning of the quote. A marked difference separates the filling of the Holy Spirit and the other ministries he performs. Regeneration, indwelling, and sealing all take place the moment we accept Christ as Savior and Lord. On the other hand, the burden of the filling of the Holy Spirit rests on us. The Holy Spirit is always ready and able to fill the believer, but he will not agree to perform this ministry unless he is in present control of the one he inhabits. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. We, and, and here's what I put at the end of her quote. We are as filled with the Holy Spirit as we are yielded to him and controlled by him. The ramifications of being spirit controlled are amazing. Haven't you met Christians that you look at them and, and, you, and we even use this terminology. 
she's really on fire for Christ. Have you heard that? And then you meet other Christians, and you know they love the Lord, they're definitely saved, but there's no spark there. <laughs> there's no real enthusiasm. They come to church, they pray, they're nice, but there's no fire. And you're like, what's the difference? Well, another analogy. I like analogies because they help my simple mind make sense. The Holy Spirit, in a way, is like a pilot light on a gas stove. The pilot light is always there, and it's always lit. But in order to get heat and light and energy to cook, you've got to turn on the gas. Does that, does that make sense? And when you do that, that's when the fire bursts up, and now there's, there's energy and there's power to cook and to provide heat. Um, so the Holy Spirit's in us, ladies. But the idea, what do we do to turn on the gas? And really what we do, like Beth Moore said, is surrender to say daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes minutely, <laughs> if that's a word. Holy Spirit, fill me. I want to decrease, and I want you to increase. Would you flow out of me? Would you help me parent? Would you love my husband? Because I don't even like him right now, you know. <laughs> but you adore him, and you are in me, and you have power, and would you help me love my husband? Would you love my husband through me? Would you flow out of me? Would you sparkle out of my eyes? Would you come out of my voice? Would you be in my embraces? So that I'm different. I, like that first, that song we sang twice, I couldn't have picked a better song and I never even heard of that song. We're called to be different. Ladies, we're called to be on fire, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in order to glorify God and show people what he's like. When we do it in the Spirit's strength, it's refreshing. When we do it in our strength, we will end up in a serious <laughs> waste land. Um, so I want to conclude. Um, this talk, I debated whether I should do this or not, but I decided, no, I'm going to do it because it really meant a lot to me. But a little setup before I show you this clip. It's about a 12-minute clip of a woman named Eleanor Mumford. Um, she spoke about the Holy Spirit at this Alpha conference I went to. Um, has anyone in here ever heard of a band called Mumford and Sons? You all have? <laughs> My daughter Molly. I'm like, Molly, you ever heard of a band called Mumford and Sons? She's like, mother, everyone in the world has heard of Mumford and Sons. I said, well, not everyone, because I never heard of them. I don't. And she said, no, they're very famous and they're popular. I'm like, okay. Well, this lady is the mother of the Mumford. And the sons aren't even related. Because I'm like, oh, well, so she has one son and the other mom. mom. No. no. <laughs> There's only one Mumford. The rest are just other people. Okay, I don't know why I'm telling you that fact. I thought it was kind of interesting. So she's, she is that guy's mother. But she is also, her and her husband um, are the national directors of the Vineyard Church in the UK and um, Ireland. And she speaks about the Holy Spirit in, in such a way, I'm only giving you a very small clip, and, and before I do that, let me say this so you understand. L5, I've told you, is a basic course in Christianity. It runs all around the world in all kinds of denominations, all kinds of social settings. It's run for about 25 years, and it truly is a tool that God is using in the world today um, to bring people to salvation and to bring people to a basic understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how he empowers you, because there's, there's a whole Holy Spirit weekend retreat involved with Alpha. Um, 
So this conference was a, people running Alpha around the United States, and there were Catholics and Protestants. There were Charismatic and non-Charismatic. There were the Baptists and the Presbyterian and the Methodists and the Lutherans. And it was fabulous because the whole uh, theme of this conference was unity, that if we could set aside our doctrinal differences, not the main issues. I'm not talking about universalism where all roads lead to heaven and all gods are fabulous. Christians setting aside the things that we can agree to disagree on and quit making those the main issue and, and have some unity over the beautiful doctrinal truths of Jesus Christ and, and the Holy Spirit and salvation. We could be such a powerful force in this world. And so Alpha really has been a tool to bring about that unity because it's just the facts of Christianity. Who is Jesus? Why did he die? Um, how can I have faith? Who's the Holy Spirit? What does he really do? How can I be filled with him? That, those are the basic talks on Alpha. Okay. So um, I tell you that because I know without a doubt some of you in this room were raised um, to really think the Holy Spirit isn't uh, active with the miraculous gifts in this day and age. Others of you in this room maybe are way over here. Um, and our pastor actually did a teaching that was helpful. He, he made a big line and he said, on this end are what you would call cessationists. And that is Christians who believe that all the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit ended. They kind of like faded out at the end of um, the New Testament age, like, because they weren't needed anymore once the church got established. So they would be called cessationists. And they would say anything to do with supernatural healings or speaking in tongues or any of the more supernatural gifts have ceased today. So if you see any act activity, run. <laughs> it's, from, it's from Satan or whatever, you know? And then way over on this end of the spectrum, you have Christians that believe that every Christian is empowered by the Holy Spirit and that um, every Christian should automatically be miraculously healed or they don't have enough faith. Every Christian should speak in tongues. And they're kind of labeled charismaniacs, okay? <laughs> but then you got a whole spectrum in between those two extremes. Some of you in the room today are going to lean more towards the cessationists, and some of you are going to lean more towards the charismaniacs. Truthfully, my own self, my brother who led me to the Lord, he verged on charismania. My father-in-law, who was a Baptist missionary, um, my husband was actually born in Africa, and he was a dead set cessationist. So Tommy, my brother, is like, hey, you need to speak in tongues. You haven't gotten all of the Holy Spirit that you need. My father-in-law is like, anybody that speaks in tongues is from the enemy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is easy to figure out. So my little heart was, God, wow. Now, the reality of both those two's lives, they were true, born again, Christ followers, on fire. They really were. I mean, it would be easy if one was just ugly and a nut. I'd be like, he's wrong, he's right. But they were both good. I'm like, God. OK, I tell you all that to say, where I settled was right in the middle. <laughs> I'm not going to judge my father-in-law. He had run up, run up against some charismatic groups in Africa that were just like off the charts. Because truthfully, guys, anything that is good and of God can be misused, mislabeled, and given a bad rap. And there are some really weird things happening that people blame on the Holy Spirit, probably aren't the Holy Spirit, but then people want to lump that all together. Do you hear what I'm saying? Anyway, so that was just what my father-in-law got raised. And then Tommy kind of finally backed off. Not, not all people speak in tongues. Not all people, um, 
you can't expect miraculous healings all the time. They do happen. They can happen. Okay, you get my point. Why I wanted to tell you all that <laughs> is because Eleanor, the Vineyard Church, would lean more towards the charis charismatic side. She's going to mention uh, tongues and stuff like that. I'm not showing you this clip in any way, shape, or form telling you which way you should go with that. I just want you to hear her talk about how she was so dead set sure <laughs> that she had this Christian life figured out and she was going to set everybody straight and then the Holy Spirit got a hold of her. So watch this and then we'll wrap up. I've said it before, I've gone on record and I'll say it again, brothers and sisters, Aslan is on the move. The Holy Spirit is at large. We just heard it proved. We are on to something that we're winning. And this is a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive. And it's a fabulous time to be a part of the kingdom. And it's a wonderful afternoon to invoke the power of the Holy Spirit. It is universally agreed, albeit very unfairly, that English cuisine is generally so threadbare that for years there has been a gentleman's agreement in the civilized world to allow the English preeminence in simply one thing, and that is in the matter of making tea. <laughs> Which, after all, comes down to very little more than the ability to boil a kettle of water. <laughs> However, boiling water is the key. The English know that tea is best made with boiling fresh water in a teapot, as opposed to with cold, salty water in a harbour which was the problem that George III had with all of you. So, just saying, okay? And that, of course, has always been a great point of tension between our two great nations, but I have crossed seas and continents in order to tell you that all is forgiven. <laughs> but we still make a better cup of tea than you do. You will be relieved to hear we're going to turn to the scriptures. And as we do, we're going to see things about the Holy Spirit. In the very, very beginning, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit hovered over, moved upon, invaded, filled the whole of the created order. He has always been at large, always living and active, always on the move, constantly at work, breathing life, literally inspiring. That's what's going on right now and right here, just as it did eons ago as he brooded and hovered over the waters. The voice of the psalmist incredulously cried out, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. So not only is the Holy Spirit life-giving, sustaining, omnipresent, omnipotent, but he has a hand. He has a hand held out that is both personal and powerful. And he has a hand that he is longing to extend to every one of us this very day, personally and powerfully. And the scriptures are bursting with instances and examples of when these things happened. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, we're told, in Judges chapter 5, and the wimp was turned into a warrior. The Spirit of the Lord came on Samson in power in Judges chapter 15, and the notorious sinner became a nominal savior of his people as he pulled down the pillars of the temple on the Philistines. In the New Testament, on his travels, Paul came to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, and we read, when he placed his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Supremely, of course, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. He returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, Luke chapter 4. And at that point, he went on to say what only he could the Spirit of the Lord, said Jesus, is upon me because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. And because the Holy Spirit was upon him and within him in total fullness, Jesus could commission his followers as he was about to leave them and go back into heaven. And he said this to them, all authority has been given to me, therefore you go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I am with you, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, everything. Jesus' own manifesto in Luke chapter 4, has, his, his manifesto has become our mandate. He declared, this is who I am, this is what I do, now you go and do the same. Everything I've taught you, he said, you go and do the same. You go and heal the sick, you go and preach the gospel, you go and visit the prisons, you go and bind up the brokenhearted, you feed the hungry, you do this stuff. Because you have the authority, we have the authority as believers. And we are the direct descendants of those disciples on the Mount of Olives. We are the immediate inheritors of his instructions to them. Those are our marching orders. And then, because Jesus has ultimate and all-time authority, he could go on to say his last recorded words on earth, which you will know well. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that, brothers and sisters, is his take it to the bank promise for all of us gathered here this afternoon. Should we be faltering at the hugeness of the task? Should we be faltering at the gravitas of the call that is upon us? Be we from Phoenix itself, as in Jerusalem? Be we from Arizona, as in Judea? Be we from Samaria, as in out of state, if one dare say so? Or be it from the ends of the earth, which is part where I come from? Nothing less than the scope of the kingdom and the incredible challenge to Alpha from one end of the earth to the other. In all its expressions, in every corner of the globe, we have the authority to go out and to do the things that Jesus has taught us to do. But we cannot go comfortless. We cannot go without the power of the Holy Spirit that we just heard about. I mean, that was stunning. That was stunning. That was as if this is the teaching and that was the illustration. That was the illustration. We might hardly even bother with this. But they go together. And what you were hearing there, it was like Augustine talked about putting salt on your lips because it makes you thirsty. That was salt on my lips. That made me thirsty. That made me desperate. That makes me want to see what we just long to see. All of us, everyone in this room, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. Because, you see, the church of God needs the power of God to pursue the cause of God across the world today. And the Holy Spirit himself, it's he that breathes life and power into the body of Christ, as he did at the very beginning, hovering over the deep. It's the Spirit of God that galvanizes the church into action, that catapults her people onto the streets of their cities, that enables us to stand firm in our places of work, even to speak for Jesus there. It's the Spirit of God that puts a spring in our step, a song in our hearts, and the wind in our sails. And to be very specific, it strengthens us to rise to the challenge that Alpha offers us. We cannot do what God is calling us to do without the power, the infilling, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We really can't. But I think we're agreed. So far, are we tracking? Is this okay? Battle axe doing the job? Brilliant, brilliant. Now I trust that we are men and women, all of us, of the scriptures. Therein lie the explanations that we cannot do without. The explanations of our faith that are of tantamount importance. And we lash ourselves to the scriptures like sailors used to lash themselves to the mast of their sailing ships in the old days during storms, in those days when Britain ruled the waves. There was a time, there was a time. Ask Napoleon, he would tell you. Because the Bible is our plumb line, it is our gold standard, it is magnetic north. 
Moses said to the people of Israel, these are not just words, they are your very life. Paul's challenge to the Romans was always, what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? We look for and we lock on constantly to the explanations God gives us there. But the Holy Spirit, as well as leading us into all truth, is to be experienced. And that's what's going on amongst us. Have you noticed we've, we've been together, I mean, we've hardly been together at all. It seemed like ever, but we've only been together less than 24 hours. And have you seen how the momentum of the Holy Spirit is building? I mean, am I being fanciful? Or are things just, it's, it's, just, it, it's just wonderful. The Lord is on the move, even in this room. So we need our explanations, but we also need our experience. For myself, I grew up in a God-fearing, church-going, Presbyterian home. I am a Presbyterian, okay? First and foremost, a Presbyterian. I became an Anglican to marry my Anglican ordained minister of a husband, and then I joined the Lunatic Fringe, which is otherwise known as the Vineyard. So, <laughs> Presbyterianism is my roots. And I, go, I went to church every year of my life. I never had reason to believe that God wasn't everything I were told he was. He was the creator of heaven and earth. He was our father who art in heaven. He was the first person of the Trinity. However, it must be said that the person of Jesus was never explained to me in, I have to say, 25 years in a Presbyterian church. But I never quite understood about Jesus in that time. And I only came to personal faith in him when I was a student. I danced the light fandango for wonderful years at St. Andrews University in Scotland, which interestingly was the very heart of the Reformation. And I was talking with the bishop this afternoon. So what a new friend, what a dear new friend. And we were talking about what an ugly history and uh, the last 500 years and what a sweet history over the last 50 with our Catholic brothers and sisters. So I was brought up in a university town where men were burnt at the stake for the scriptures. And it affected me profoundly. People would die for this stuff. It's very, very deep. I valiantly fought off the evangelistic advances of the Christ Christian Union for years, some of whose members spelt, had special prayer meetings for the sake of my soul. God bless them. They went on and on to no avail. And as an aside, let me tell you, I had one friend with whom I shared a room, and she was engagingly attractive as a Christian. She undertook to pray for her roommate every day until that roommate came to Jesus. And then she met me, the biggest hypocrite of them all, because I read my Bible, I dropped to my knees at night because she did, I went to chapel because I wanted to be seen there, I was impossible. And she went back to the Lord and she said, look, I'm so sorry, but I think you and I need to renegotiate. This woman is really impossible. And the Lord said to her, you promised and you carry on with your promise. And she prayed for me every day for five years. Her name was Debbie Flint. Her son is Toby Flint, whom you may just have seen on the Alpha videos, if you've seen the new ones. And he is my godson. So anyway, it's all of which says absolutely nothing, except if you do nothing else but cry out for the soul of one person. Just look at what, it, my life has been rescued. So much do I owe to the faithful, secret, agonized prayer prayers of a friend over so long. I felt the Lord say to me today, even this afternoon, there'll be one person who comes into your head as I say that. One person whom you could undertake to pray for indefinitely until they come to a knowledge of Jesus. So God was my father, Jesus was now my savior, but I was extremely sniffy about the Holy Spirit, suspicious of, uneasy with, I was converted and raised in a stable that was cessationist, dispensationalist, anti-charismatic, controlled. And I was taught that all the weirdest activity of the book of Acts died out at the end of it. And that the Holy Spirit had been kindly given to give a sort of kickstart to the early church. It seemed sensible enough to me, and I lived with that. And so obediently, I took my nail scissors to every single, metaphorically, every single page in the New Testament that I thought was weird. So everything snipped out. So there was no tongues, there was certainly no tongues. There was no um, miracles, no signs and wonders, no demons, good gracious me, no healing. Any of that weird stuff was snipped out. And I do have to admit 
that at the end of my exercise, I had a very filleted, disemboweled copy of the New Testament, which was increasingly thin and strangely ineffective. And then, is this boring you? I'm all right. I've lost track of the time. Um, but if there is a point here. There is a point somewhere, I promise. I married my wonderful John. I, got, I, got, I did get saved. All was well. But I didn't like the Holy Spirit. And then I married my wonderful John. And we began working together in an Anglican parish because he was ordained. And he was serving as a curate there. It was fabulous. And we loved it. Although I have to say the whole of the staff to a man and a woman was charismatic. Charismatic, weird, <laughs> dead weird. And yet we wanted to endure our time at this parish because the man who led it was the greatest trainer of priests in the Church of England at that time. So we thought, well, we'll hold our noses like underwater for three years and we'll ignore the Holy Spirit stuff. And in his kindness, God might even use us to straighten them out. <laughs> we did. Honestly, the arrogance, the arrogance of the woman However, the Lord had another plan, and a month or two into marriage, I need to say that we had been secretly engaged for nearly four years, so marriage was a huge relief. But after having got married, I was literally felled with meningitis, felled, terribly ill, unlikely to live, whizzed off to hospital. It was terrible. And my darling John had to preach that morning in the, chapel, in the, in the parish church. And in the Anglican system, then you, you had a bit you had to preach on. And this was John 11, when Jesus went to the tomb of the sisters, and he said, this sickness is not unto death. And for the first time, we began to think, in retrospect, obviously, we began to think the Lord speaks through the scriptures for today. Amazing. Well, anyway, I lived, obviously. And then... Um, <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I lived. Well, some might question it. But I went to... Um, <laughs> After six weeks, I was still terribly ill, cracking headaches, terrible weakness, not able to do anything, not able to do all the things the young bride wanted to do, which in my case was show off all my new stuff and all my new recipes and all my new home and everything. Couldn't do a thing. Hopeless. And so after six weeks, I crawled to church. You need to remember that the church for Cray was filled with these charismatic people. And the vicar greeted me at the door and he said, oh, my dear Eleanor, how lovely to see you. I'm so sorry. You, do, you don't seem at all well. And I thought, well, oh, thanks a bunch. If that's what you call a gift of discernment, I'm really not impressed. I could have told you that. So anyway, he said, why don't you, co why don't you come to the um, church tomorrow morning, uh, the staff meeting tomorrow morning, and we'd love to pray for you. And I thought, oh, for crying out loud, I know what that looks like. That means they're all, it's Monday morning, and they're charismatics, okay? So they're all smiley and keen and friendly. And they're going to take me in at 9 o'clock in the morning, and they're going to sit me in the middle of the room, in a chair with everybody else around me. Horrible, exposed. And then they're going to advance upon me and they're going to, they're going to move in on my personal space. And then they're going to put their sweaty hands all over me. I know they are. They call it laying on of hands. And then worst of all, they're going to pray over me in tongues, which to me sounded like lots of people crocheting or knitting all at once. <laughs> click, click, click. Do you know, it turned out it turned out that the woman that stands before you was more highly prophetic than she knew. Everything I thought happened. Everything. All smiley and eager, sat me down in the middle of the room, came in on my personal space, put their stinky little hands all over me, and then started knitting furiously. But do you know what? Do you know what? I was instantaneously healed of severe meningitis there and then. There and then. It was beyond wonderful, but it was very embarrassing. The rule and the reign of the king and the kingdom had burst into my world. The presence of the Holy Spirit had made himself experienced and felt. And his part in my world was now inarguable. It could no longer be doubted. It could certainly not be ignored. And it had changed everything. And it also meant, people, that if what happened to me was doable, if it was that we could go out and preach the gospel and pray for the sick and talk about Jesus and do the things that he did, then all bets were off. Everything was changed. And as we come in touch with the Holy Spirit, as he fills us anew, which is about to do this afternoon for that 970th time, whatever, we can go out and do the things he said to do. 
And we will use alpha. I mean, this isn't all, all about alpha. It's about what it achieves and what it does. Bringing people to faith. Raising the name of Jesus. Changing our world. I don't know how many people there are in the room. Millions, looks to me like. I mean, millions. But say for the sake of argument, for mathematics, there were a thousand. You could change a thousand circles of influence in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why would you not? Why would we not pray for that? It's too much fun. It's too amazing. So my reluctance had given way to the recognition of a glorious fact. And I had been changed in a moment. Now, every one of us has a story. That happens to be my story, and I rather love it because it changed my life. But every one of us has a story. Use your story. Develop your story. Go out and find stories. Go out and pray for people on the bus. Go out and get words of knowledge for people on the train. Do anything. Pray for the sick. Get your neighbors to come around to barbecue. Do anything to get stories. I had a next door neighbor in London who's little, I've, I've lost my track. Am I all right? Is this all right? Um, I've got it all here in notes, honestly. But I, I have a neighbor in London and she had a little boy born to her. She had three, four children and the little fourth one was born and he was terribly, terribly chromosomally affected and disabled. He was never going to walk or talk or eat other than through a tube in his tummy. He was blind, he was deaf, he was vegetative almost. But my friend next door just loved this little boy. And the Lord said to me early on, I want you to go in every now and again when I tell you and pray for him. I mean, it was just a no, there was nothing, it was very severe. But I did, I did, I went in and whenever I felt prompted from the Lord, I went in and prayed and the mummy came to faith, which was lovely. And then one day he was three or four, I suppose, lying out on her knee, just flat out like a little corpse. And the Lord said to me, go in and pray. So I did. And I looked at him and I just said, Lord Jesus, would you just strengthen this little boy's body? Half an hour later, I got a text. He was walking. He had walked along the railings of the school, holding the railings because he was blind, hanging onto the railings at the school gate as he met his little sister. I thought to myself, God, you've broken through. And that was through gossiping the gospel over the garden fence, people. It's not that hard. Next door, neighbors. Jay Pathic, take note. She was my neighbor and I knew her name, okay? <laughs> and I told her so. We, they said in the book of Acts, we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. I cannot but speak of the stories that I've heard. I cannot but tell you of the things that I know. And there's so many stories I could tell you, and there isn't the time. But I just want to remind you, you see, the Holy Spirit convicts. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts. It's the Holy Spirit who does this stuff. I mean, Alpha is a great formula, but rather, like you said, it's good, but it's, you know, it's not that good. It's great, and I love it, and they're all my best friends in the world. But, you know, okay, it's a formula. But no, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts people that draws them to faith, that has them falling on their faces. What must I do to be saved? Do you wonder, do you wonder that it's so great to use? Do you know I have a friend in New York, in fact, I have several friends around the place, but this is a particular friend in New York, and he has been leading an alpha group in the roughest of prisons in New York. The course has been extremely hard going. All men, it's a men's jail, all hardened criminals, gang members, and worse, all very cynical and all very disruptive, like sort of overgrown but malevolent schoolboys. Every week we were all praying, praying our socks off to seemingly very little effect. Holy Spirit Day came and went, we prayed our prayers, nothing. And then on the last day of the course, he sent out a particular note and asked us all to pray and unrolled our prayer mats again. The first man came into the room, toughest of the tough. And he just said, I can't do this anymore. I need Jesus. The second man came into the room, hard as nails, leader of the pack, cynical and subversive. I give up, he said. Okay, I need Jesus. And at the end of the evening, our friend let down the net. And he said, is there anyone else here who would like to invite Jesus to come into their lives? 
every single man came to Christ. Every single one. The power of the Holy Spirit to convict. He convicts us. He convicts us of our sin. He convinces us of our faith. He convinces us that this is true. I have so many more stories I could tell you, and there isn't time. The Holy Spirit liberates us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, we're told, there is freedom. I prayed with a young woman a little while back, hundreds of miles from here, and she said she was angry with God. Never a good idea. She was angry, of course, over a relationship that hadn't worked out. And she said this, she said, I've been haunted for over a year. It won't go away. It has completely overshadowed everything else in my life. The bitterness in my heart is a weed that is strangling me. We prayed together, she said to me. I asked for forgiveness for my anger. I have been completely set free and the relief I have is stunning. The Holy Spirit liberates. And then finally, the Holy Spirit, I'm coming into land, people. Finally, landing lights on, we're on our way. The Holy Spirit comes upon us, and that's what we're going to pray for. Think back to Gideon. Think back to Samson. Think back in 1 Samuel, where Samuel said to Saul, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy. You will be changed into a different person. One of the most significant promises that I love, if you stop to think about it, we can ask the Holy Spirit to come, and in his mercy, even this afternoon, in his kindness, he will come upon us. We can be changed from feeling weak to being strong, from feeling fearful to being brave, from feeling ourselves tongue-tied to becoming fluent, from cowering in the wine press like Gideon to braving the battlefield to which we're called. And beyond those doors, people, is the battlefield. From being dead ordinary to becoming extraordinary. And let me finish with one more story. Do you bore of stories? You tire? You ready to leave? Good. I was counting on you. There is a small, small vineyard church on the west coast of Norway where they have been teaching a class on praying for the sick. And in the college, in the um, class, there was a Bible college student, a girl who was painfully, painfully shy. She left the class and she boarded the bus to go home. And at the back of the bus, she saw a girl that she thought she recognized with a child on her lap and a place beside her. So this girl thought, well, I better go and sit beside her. So she went and sat down. It turned out that this young mother had indeed been a part of the church, but she'd given it all up. She'd met a boyfriend. She had become with child. The boyfriend was no longer anywhere on the scene. Her mother had told her to have an abortion, and God bless her, she refused. And so she had the baby. When the baby was born, the mother, the grandmother, helpfully said, I told you you should have had an abortion. This baby is so ugly. Yeah. So as the Bible college girl looked at the baby, she said to herself, I see what she means. The baby was very ugly. It was born with an open lip, huge hole in its face, and was obviously very, very sickly. Now our friend knew she had to pray for her. She'd just done a class on it for crying out loud. She was terrified. She wished she'd never spotted her. She wished she hadn't sat in that seat. This is a small city, she said afterwards. Everyone will know this is a crowded bus. Everyone will hear. She later wrote, it was so embarrassing, but I had to do it. And so I asked this girl in a very small voice, is it okay if I pray? And I'll read you the rest of the story. She said, I made myself as little as I could and with a very quiet voice and speaking very fast, afraid the people on the bus would hear. I said, God, will you please interfere in this situation? Is that a good prayer? I love it. I would take that one to the bank. God, will you please interfere in this situation? Will you interfere in our lives today? Will you mess us up? Anyway, that's just yeah, for later. I looked down at the baby. We've got to finish this story. I looked down at the baby and there, the open lip had disappeared. There was no sign of what was there before. The lip was perfectly normal. I screamed. The mother cried loud. I thought, I am insane. <laughs> this is not possible. I couldn't believe what had just happened. The mother screamed again. We cried more. I got her cell number.
bit of fun. Not quite the end of the story. Later, the mother rang her to say that she'd taken the baby back to the hospital. They couldn't believe what they saw, so they sent them, her on with the baby to a specialist in um, Oslo. What we learnt was that the heart was wrong, the lungs were wrong, the kidneys were wrong, and the urine was the wrong colour, and the child was dying. Incredulously, all the tests were done, and the baby was declared absolutely 100% normal. Heart normal, lungs normal, kidneys normal, urine normal. The specialist said, this is impossible. The baby in your arms is totally different from the baby on our medical records. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon a shy, ordinary, reluctant, frightened little believer in the back of the bus. That's what we need, people. We need the power of the Holy Spirit that will make us brave enough to go out and to sit in the back of the bus and to have mercy on the people around us and to see the things that are wrong and to seek to put them right in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be brave, people. We need to be brave and we cannot be so on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. He alone can bring it to pass. The Holy Spirit came upon her. The wonderful, wonderful Cardinal Sunans, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Belgium in the 70s, he said, God writes extraordinary novels for those of us who are ready to play his game and are willing to open their lives to the unexpected action of the Holy Spirit. And the people said, Amen. I would encourage you to practice because when we get to heaven, you will discover, Amen is how they say it, okay? Yeah.